Hi, I'm Joan Rabbits. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Product for um, HGST, which is a brand of Western Digital. And I work in the Data Center Systems Business Group, which means that I don't work on disk drives and flash drives. I work on the other end of the spectrum kind of systems. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that are going on with our business in media and entertainment around very large scalable archive storage systems. So one of the use cases for the kinds of products that we're building that are large and scalable, and when I mean large and scalable, I mean starting at about three quarters of a petabyte and going up from there. Um, the most obvious use case for that in media and entertainment is archiving, right? Um, everybody needs to archive their uh, protected content, the content that's most valuable to them, um, either for insurance reasons or for business uh, justification. And today, or yesterday, depending on the, uh, the company, that data was kept on tape or some combination of tape and some kind of disk storage. Um, but the primary focus is on archiving film assets at the end of a film or during the production of a film and then restoring those assets on request later, usually because people are looking for reuse or they just want to look at those assets. Um, so just to give you an example of what does that look like today, uh, one of the customers that we work with is a major studio and they currently have about 12 petabytes of data archived. Uh, they're on their way to about 20. And that's just with current technology and current uh, level of resolutions. Um, because this is insurance-based uh, storage, they have to have it fully protected. So they actually have this data protected across three unique sites. And um, they said it, it, with each film, the, the amount of data per final film is growing. Uh, each film is currently one to two petabytes, but there's big range on that uh, depending on how much uh, special effects are in the film, et cetera. It can be quite a bit larger. Um, so I talked to the woman who's in charge of media asset management for this studio, and I asked, you know, it's archiving. They're just, just barely coming off of tape. How often are you doing restores? And she said, well, I have two people who full-time do restores. To me, that sounded like a lot of people. So I said, well, how many restores are you doing a month? Well, I'm doing 200 restores a month. So I'm calculating that, divide by 20, that's 10 a day. And I asked, well, on a monthly basis, those 200 restores, how much data are you actually restoring for people to look at? And the answer was a petabyte. Now, it's not true that you would look at different data every time someone asks for a restore, but just imagine they did, right? If they did, that means they're churning 100% of that data every year. On tape, two people running around, sneakers, restoring data for people. Okay, so, so um, most companies that are doing this are moving to something other than tape, and they're doing it in some form of digital archive, uh, one would hope. Um, now, so what? That's today, right? The more interesting thing is what's going to happen tomorrow. So some obvious things are going to change. Resolutions are going up. There's 2K, 4K, 8K resolution cameras. And um, so just on the surface, the amount of data that's going to be kept for a final film is going to grow. Secondly, um, film um, media assets now are typically a little bit more um, diverse than they used to be. So I, I would you know, have a film and it's watched and it's you know, in the movie theaters and then on DVD. But today there's a lot more content being wrapped around that or be just beginning to be wrapped around that. And I expect that that's going to continue to grow. So simple example, virtual reality. Am I going to go to full virtual reality movies? I don't know. But already, every time a film is made, a virtual reality uh, component is created um, for marketing purposes or because they don't know how to monetize yet, so they're starting to capture that. So some of our customers tell stories like, uh, I decided, hey, this would be a great scene to do virtual reality of. I decided that a week after the scene was, was completed, I ripped down the set, everyone's gone, now what do I do? Um, so one option is I go back to my film or uh, other assets, digital assets, and I recreate the scene uh, using special effects. Or I you know, recreate something like the scene um, using special effects. Another thing I've heard is we get to the end of the scene. I've got 
hundreds of people on set, they're all in costumes, and I decide, huh, this, would, this ballroom scene would have been a great virtual reality scene. Um, let's stop, we'll keep everyone on set, we'll stay for four hours, we'll refilm this stuff for uh, virtual reality. So, um, so this happens, um, what does it mean? It means that just keeping the final film asset may not be valuable enough that a lot of these added value uses of various types might require that I keep more, like I might keep the dailies. Maybe I'll just keep them for a week. Maybe I keep them for the full film. Um, the other interesting thing is that the ratio of not kept edited out assets to kept, edited, uh, kept in assets, that ratio is changing, right? The more a film has special effects, the more there's, there's CGI in the film, the more the ratio goes up. So I might have 50 times the edited out assets compared to the one that I keep versus maybe say a two to one ratio or a five to one ratio, which might be more typical for a traditional film. So what does that mean? That means that if I'm only archiving the final asset, great, but if I'm archiving some of the things that are gonna get edited out or might get edited out, uh, the ratio of storage could be pretty high, right? I could be keeping a significant amount of additional assets. On the other hand, I could be saving a huge amount of money by reusing those uh, for some of these other types of content, okay? Unfortunately, in order to do that, I've gotta find it, right? So today's assets, obviously, if I'm keeping all my digital assets on tape, I'm having a hard time finding it, which is why I have two people running around doing these 200 restores. Um, if, if a studio wants to start keeping more assets, more of the temporary edits, there's less likely to be full knowledge of exactly where and when I might have the piece that I want. Uh, I've had people in the animation space say things like, well, you know, the most expensive things to produce are crowd scenes. And I want to go back to a previous version of an animated movie and I want to find the crowd scene because I can reuse that and it's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? How do I find it? Right? Other than remembering, uh, it was exactly in this spot in the film where I might have named things, uh, file names. We don't have a way to find things easily. So the more we want to create more, the more we have to be able to find things. So there's work going on already in the media and entertainment space for how do I classify data um, in these films? How can I tag them? How can I add extra metadata to help me find things? And I think we're going to see even further down the road uh, people going into uh, digital film assets or video assets and actually using new video search technologies as well. Find me something that looks like this, like you can do with um, Google search. So um, what's going to happen is this, these things have to go together, right? I'm, I'm going to start finding uses for uh, additional variations or versions of the original digital asset. But as I find uses for them, I also have to be able to find. So I think we're going to see a growth in the amount of data stored, but more importantly, the uh, variety of ways that you find the stuff that you want. Um, and those things need to go hand in hand. Um, Right, and so there's also other, other than just reuse, there's also workflow optimization. And I know that some people in the media and entertainment space, particularly people who are doing animation, have been doing this for a long time, and that's workflow optimization. What they do is they keep metadata about their process built into the file itself, the, the digital assets, so they can track how long did this scene spend time in this part of rendering? How, how long did it spend in this next step? Uh, how many times did I have to recycle through? And this is how they learn how to optimize the process, uh, which also saves them a huge amount of money. So the data itself is valuable, so I can find, search, reuse, um, but the metadata is valuable as well for optimizing processes and cutting time down. Um, and there's a little bit of that going on. I think we're going to see, again, the more you have data, the more there's going to be pressure for these kinds of capabilities. And ta-da. Okay, second big use case for big data repositories is production and post-production, the actual workflow. Um, and what happens usually is data is ingested, of course, and then stored uh, usually by your media asset manager in a, a large storage. Uh, of course, here I'm showing our product, uh, which it runs in multiple geographies. So, so that's what the, the geo one, two, and three mean. Um, and then it's edited. And usually when data is edited, it gets copied into a faster 
uh, storage with a faster connection so that the people who are sitting at editing stations can get more done and can load up uh, a big chunk of data at one time. And uh, archive storage systems tend to be designed around sort of the Amazon S3 secondary store model, not around a load everything into memory, work on it kind of model. Um, they don't necessarily have to be in conflict, but they're, they're often different. So this is the traditional workflow. And then um, if I'm going to do something like distribute, I will also potentially make another copy of the data um, right before I distribute, so I, and that's more of a holding place. Um, so I'm not even showing that here, but it, it's uh, often that data is kept for some limited period of time not to be archived, but to be held so that it can be distributed or played out in the case of broadcast, right? So this is the workflow today. Um, how is that likely to change? Well, one big way that it's probably gonna change is that uh, we're already bursting some reasonable percentage of the edit workflow into public clouds. Um, and we need to be able to, to move the data with that. It turns out that we're really, really good at moving compute around and not so good at moving the data that that compute is dependent on around. And unfortunately, the economics are not great because of the way um, public cloud providers operate. It's, it's cheap to get data in and expensive to, to get data out, which sometimes that works, like in the case of, of editing. If I load up a lot of data, but then I only return a result, maybe it's okay. But if I have to return everything back that I loaded up, that cost is really high. Um, so, so there's this aspect of wanting to maybe use both because I'm bursting. So, so now there's a, a desire to have the, the compute be completely um, transparent to where it's running containerization, virtualization, some of the things that are being talked about in the conference. But also, what about the data? The data needs to be in a common format. It needs to be movable, protected while it's being moved or used, uh, et cetera. So um, we see in the case of um, edit, historically, workflows, uh, data was usually kept as files. Um, turns out that's, that's less than ideal for a cloud environment, so we see more companies moving to uh, S3 backend, which is more amenable to a cloud native application. Um, and so, uh, for example, if we were just to focus in for a second on just one box, the, the MAM media asset managers, I, I just have the name of one as an example, but for all the media asset managers, you see them all developing S3 uh, file to S3 and um, S3 capabilities. And the reason for that is because um, in, a, in a bursting multi-cloud environment, uh, you know, file formats probably not ideal. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of change there. We're also seeing um, some discussion about how do I merge these different types of storage, right? Do I need to have this really fast capability on a, on a, a fast network so I can load a bunch of stuff into memory for rendering and, I, and then I have to have some separate archive or is there a way to start combining those? So um, some, some of our customers are asking, you know, why do I have to keep it and then copy it uh, in and out and then potentially copy it up to the cloud and out, is there a better way? Um, and so I think we'll see some movement there. Um, and then, um, you know, I said that uh, ingest is getting bigger, right? The, the cameras are creating higher resolutions. Uh, people are keeping more variations of, of raw data. So, so ingest is just going to keep getting bigger, which just takes everything in the workflow and extends the problems um, associated with, with holding and moving uh, large amounts of, of data. So I expect this problem will just continue to be annoyingly big. Okay, so um, a third area where people are keeping large amounts of data, today relatively temporarily is content distribution. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna merge um, content distribution like CDN and um, content distribution like I store it and then I play it out. Um, and that's only because I'm not directly in the space and the difference to me is maybe not as important as it is to you. Um, so data is kept long enough to be distributed or played out, right? It can be loaded again, uh, so there's, there's no reason to particularly protect the holding space unless it's your only copy. 
Um, but you do see more and more of our customers trying to um, have more points of presence, more places from which they distribute content. They're distributing content to more different uh, types of uh, devices. So we also see people saying, hey, you know, there's a real opportunity right now to take content and distribute it directly to someone's mobile device. And that is going to really change the flavor of these architectures that were designed where I have one big central archive store of data and then it's distributed via uh, some kind of a distribution network like Akamai or others and then, you know, played out from there. Uh, if you were, think we're going to see maybe both a collapsing of the middlemen and at the same time the creation of a requirement for new types of both storage and processing at these various locations. Uh, all at the same time. So distribution in the future. Um, most of the people that we work with who are in this space are trying to either already are or are in the process of be becoming service providers themselves. And they're doing this in partnership with people who already are service providers in the space or they're becoming that themselves. Or they may have even been created as a joint venture specifically to be a service provider. Uh, this has particularly happened in, in Europe and, and Asia, uh, where you have smaller markets. So what happened is people who were in the process, from our perspective, as the guys sitting behind them being the archive uh, place where they're keeping everything before it's distributed or played out, what that means to us is that we now become part of a service offering. So it causes you to have to rethink, what does that mean? Um, I'm not just providing that service for one, one um, company. Uh, they're providing it for many, and those different companies have, for example, they all have different media asset managers, potentially. They may have slightly different requirements. They also may want different value-added services. So what we see is people who just used to be in the business of doing CDN or play out becoming service providers with a range of value-added services. Because they're sitting in the middle, they already have relationships with the providers, the source providers. They typically already have high-performance network connections uh, to the, at each of these points of presence. And, um, and so they're kind of already set up to be in the business. But it's not their core business, it's not what they're used to. So I think we're gonna see sort of a, a reshuffling of, of who provides what service for whom. And along the way, a desire and, and a real pressure for value added services. So what's coming to us as the people sitting behind them today in the archive is them coming and saying, well, what else can I do? Uh, what else can I do using this data that you're storing for me? Maybe I'm not just going to keep it for 48 hours while I do play out to all the various uh, TV stations. Maybe I want to keep that for months or maybe forever because I can offer value-added services around it to help people find and reuse the content. Uh, maybe I want to have value-added services to do things like also back up that data for my clients. Uh, gracious, they're sending it to me already. Why wouldn't I, for example, do that? So I think we're going to see the people who are in the, in the food chain of content distribution start to play very different roles. And I think the next step beyond that is going to be when um, uh, it, these, th at the same time we have people wanting to be service providers in the middle, we're also going to see the content creators saying, hey, you know what, I can distribute this stuff right to mobile phones myself. Why do I need all these people in the middle. Well, you still need people in the middle. You still need to have points of presence even more so. But maybe the services that are provided by them also need to include now more than just keeping a copy of the data. Maybe it needs to include some computing, for example, um, so that I can push you know, a, a specific version into a, a mobile device or um, some intelligence about, about what kind of things I should be expecting to push so I can cache them ahead of time. So, so I think we're gonna see middlemen who are service providers um, I think we're going to see them start to think about value add services and I think we're going to see them being pushed to do more than just service the data uh, because of the way people want to use the data going forward. And the best example we have of this is actually not exactly content distribution but one of our customers is the Montreux Jazz Festival and they have 50 years of data, a lot of it video actually. Uh, you think of them as, okay, it's all the jazz recordings. Well, yeah, it is, but it's also the video of all the festivals. And they said, okay, we don't wanna lose this. It's a historical artifact, we wanna protect it. Great, so they're archiving that data, but as soon as they had it archived, they realized, huh, 
now I can provide access to all of my you know, users and, and, um, and to our market via, directly. So they are also providing a playback uh, streaming service where you can now, not only that data is kept, but you can stream it to your phone uh, back 50 years. So we're gonna see this everywhere, right? First, I just wanna keep it and protect the data. And as soon as I've done that, I immediately see opportunities for making it available to a, to an, a different audience in a different way and um, kind of seeing that everywhere. Okay, so what did I talk about? I talked about sort of the three core examples uh, that you would think of when you think about archiving large amounts of data like petabytes and petabytes of data. Uh, some of our biggest customers have 50 petabytes of data. The first most obvious one is I'm archiving it for uh, protection purposes or for insurance purposes and I need to do that in a reliable way. But, um, and, and the second use case is I, I've got that data available and it's integrated into my workflow. So it's not just an archive, but it's somehow part of my ingest, store, edit workflow. And the third is I'm in the business of distributing that data in some form and I want to integrate this archive into the way that I distribute data. And in all three cases, uh, we see a big change both in the amount of data the ways people want to use it, the ways they want to distribute it, and the types of uh, value-added services that are required to enable that, which especially includes analytics, it includes being able to search and find, it includes being able to pull data out and reprocess it, uh, push it to locations in and out of the cloud, and uh, I think this is gonna sort of fundamentally change. Uh, my, my prediction is that in a few years we won't talk about archiving data anymore because archiving will be sort of the less relevant aspect uh, of what we do. So, thank you. <laughs>